so happy we alive. Good evening and welcome to Louisville Late Night. This evening we're in lovely Vancouver, Canada and we're privileged to have with us a real mover and shaker in the marijuana decriminalization movement and uh, someone who is uh, responsible for uh, tremendous advances that have, been, that have taken place here in Canada and uh, someone who is uh, spreading uh, the good word around the uh, earth in a number of different ways. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, Mr. Mark Emery. My tax, yeah, because even I have to declare a fairly substantial personal income because although I regard a lot of our, like we gave around, we gave about half a million dollars away in the last half year and probably close to a million in the last two and a half years just to American prisoners of the drug war, lawyers for Americans. I mean, for this is money that uh, that you have earned through the seed company. Yeah, to through some the seed company. For example, we, you know, there was a clash action suit a couple of years ago in Philadelphia um, for the medical marijuana people suing the federal government. Didn't work, but you know, we spent thirty-five thousand dollars on that. I would have given uh, I've given lawyers like in Seattle to defend the Green Cross and people associated with the Green Cross four thousand bucks recently. I gave Ben Mizell a thousand dollar grant. I gave Cures Not War, Dana Beals group that do the Million Marijuana March. I gave them about fifteen thousand dollars in the last four months. Oh wow! Uh, we're their primary sponsor. We gave the uh, the uh, the March in London, England for Million Marijuana March and their festival. We give they gave them a grant of about four thousand pounds, so ten thousand dollars there. And uh, we give money to the groups in Australia, New Zealand. During the New Zealand federal election two and a half years ago, we bought full-page ads in two newspapers to promote the legalized marijuana party that's in New Zealand. And uh, yeah, I heard they had a report <coughs> at the National Normal. And we're paying for the we're we're the largest contributors to the Supreme Court case. There's a Supreme Court hearing at the end of this year in Canada that will clearly debate whether marijuana should be legal or not. That that's the actual premise. Should the state have the right to criminalize? Behavior that the, the the courts have already ruled is not harmful. The courts in Canada have ruled marijuana smoking is not harmful, and so the Supreme Court is listening to an argument that says, "Well, can the government make something illegal that's not harmful?" I mean, really, our our constitution protects the right of consenting adults to do a consenting activity, and uh, so therefore, can the government prescribe consenting activity that's harmless? And I'm hoping the Supreme Court agrees with us, in which case that would finally end the marijuana wars in Canada. If all goes well, the United States is disturbed at this prospect as they are when there's any apparent liberalization. But uh, yeah. so we're the contrib leading contributors to that, and uh, most everything you see in, in, you know, we, for example, when the medical marijuana clubs get raided or have to go to court, we pay for their legal offenses. The Vicks in Victoria, we gave them about 10 grand. Ted Smith's Compassion Club, 5 grand. And on and on it goes. Like, there's just, you know, we've given money away to hundreds and hundreds of groups throughout uh, really? the United States and Canada in the last two years. That's wonderful. And, or well, we'd easily, easily be the leading contributor after George Soros. We've probably given $2 million to the movement in the last seven years, but certainly in the last two and a half, it's about a million. And uh, it's mostly raised for the sale of seats. And, uh, and even if they thwarted us doing that by mail or something, we'd simply just have to open a store and sell them more publicly again. Like, you know, getting raided and getting arrested, it, it, for me, isn't a big deal. It's just that, you know, you ha you, you, it's going to happen sooner or later and you just don't worry about it. But again, in Canada, they don't put you away forever like they do in the United States. I mean, Todd McCormick's spent five years. Peter McWilliams died. People get five, ten years crazy-ass sentences all the time in the United States for stuff. I take people on tour, so we had the Tokers Bowl here. On May 2nd to 5th, and we invited, we put an ad out in our magazine, just one issue, and said, for 350 US, come on up here, party for four days, hang out with all my crew and everybody involved in our organization. And, and we had four nights of fabulous parties. We had 14 pounds of pot. Every American that came up got a bowl. It's called the Toker's Bowl, and they got a metal tin with 24 different kinds of pot, a gram and a half of it in there. Wow. And they had to smoke it all in four days. And we had, uh, we, we, you know, on, it was a beautiful weekend. I launched my campaign for mayor that day with full page ads in the daily papers while the Americans were here so they could see, you know, the kind of activism we did. And I would do wow. interviews in the middle of the Toker's Bowl. And then so. we had the Million Marijuana March on the Saturday. We went out on, on the Friday night. We had a thousand and one Arabian Nights theme night at a, a big restaurant where 200 people were there. We had naked body painted women, and boy, they were hot looking too. But with cannabis leaves painted on them, and they were walking around. And uh, we had belly dancers with. 
candelabras on their head dancing around. Uh, now is this, is, this, is this going to be an annual event? Oh yeah, it'll be uh, next year too. It'll be the Million Marijuana March weekend. So it'll probably be the first weekend in May. First weekend in May. Yeah, and it'll probably be about $500 US, but it'll still be a deal of a lifetime. And uh -huh. we've got 105 people this year. Next year we'll take uh, no more than 200. And basically we partied on a boat, we rented a massive ship that can handle 300 people and we went out to sea and there was food at all these, it was endless food. So, so you're going to outdo the Cannabis <laughs> Cup Festival and... Uh, well we, figured, we felt now. that ours, and you can go to pottv.net now and watch a little bit of an appetizer uh -huh. about what it was like to uh, be at the Toker's Bowl, but I, I regard it as far superior to the Cannabis Cup. The Cannabis Cup has one enviable advantage, you're in Amsterdam and uh -huh. you can get any kind of pot you want in Amsterdam, it's like a Toker's Paradise. Whereas our people had a beautiful environment and a totally sensual, romantic, and uh, a very appropriate set of venues. Uh, boats, uh, romantic uh, historical theme nights, uh, beautiful parties here at the headquarters and next door at the New Amsterdam. And then finally a day of balloting at a big studio we rented and <coughs> had all sorts of cool stuff. And everybody had a fabulous time and, and their money paid for everything, the, the, the cost of the weed, the food, all the entertainment was covered so there was no need to expend any kind of money. And it was a beautiful, magical time, and we'll be doing that again next year with different theme nights and some other stuff. But yeah, not a single hitch. So, you know, you can come to Canada and you can smoke pot with relative safety. And it's not as easy to acquire it if you don't know anybody because <coughs> there's not a lot of money in retail around. And strangely enough, there's not a lot of weed sellers around here, even though there's not really, you know, the odds of getting caught aren't that great. But the problem is there's just not a lot of money in the point of sale selling it by the gram. There's not the money here like there is in the United States because most people here have connections where they buy an ounce or mm -hmm. something from. And so it's a different setup here in Canada. Uh -huh, it's easy to find pot once you know someone you live here, but if you're just visiting for a day or two, it's always a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you think that the, uh, the movement, uh, progressive movement, uh, it's reached a point in Canada where it's not going to suddenly go backwards like happened in the United States. Well, we thought we were making a little progress back in the 70s. In fact, we thought it was ready to be decriminalized, well, the and then all of a sudden it just went... What know, happened, though, in the late 70s is that Watergate sidetracked the big statist corporate military industrial you know, gravy train. So from the period of the Watergate hearings from about 74 to about Reagan's inauguration in 81, there was this period of freedom because the, the, the state had been so thoroughly impugned you know, the credibility of the government, of the state itself, had been so thoroughly impugned and people were so rightfully cynical that the government was just made up of crooks and crazy psychotics like Nixon and his ilk, that there was a general tendency to give the people the benefit of the doubt. That is, the individuals in society the benefit of the doubt over the government. So that period between the Watergate hearings and Nixon's resignation, and of course Nixon was the architect of the drug war, and I'm sure Gerald Ford didn't have nearly the same stomach to pursue it, and certainly neither did Jimmy Carter. And <clears throat> so you had a brief six, seven year period where the for progressive forces could move forward in their agenda to decrim, and that happened in a lot of states, and to get marijuana scaled down as to the degree of severity with which the courts dealt with it. But of course the Rockefeller laws came in in the same period of time, so it wasn't all a consistently nice period. So, But generally that was it. And then once Reagan came in and the rhetoric stepped up and the police state reasserted itself once again, then it's been miserable since then. And there's been really very little let up. I mean, were, those were miracles when Proposition 215 passed. Dennis uh, Perot was here in 1996. We had a, a, a special 25th anniversary of a, of a police riot where the police beat up uh, hundreds of spectators that have marijuana smoke in in 1971 and hospitalized a lot of people including innocent bystanders and it was just a, a, a gross act of cruelty that is very famous in Western Canada because it isn't common out here uh, like it w is in the United States and 25 years later we had a big we took over the same square and we were allowed to do so because the police since then have become very sensitive to their own brutality and uh, we invited Dennis up to speak, and then a few days before he was due to speak, after we gave him a great big party the night before, the, his club in San Francisco was raided in, uh, in August of that year, August 5th, I think, in 1996, and that really catapulted the 215 movement forward after his club got raided. So we were here at these momentous times and advising Dennis what to do, and uh, he, of course, got on the next plane. We packed him off on the next plane, and he was back there rallying.